All right, uh, this week's presentation is on building durability or material durability. It's uh, a little bit of a unique presentation in regard to green building. Um, in that, it's not always a topic that's in addressed in uh, green building rating systems. It is, however, a topic that's near and dear to me. Uh, my dissertation work was on building durability and material longevity. The fundamental question when you talk about building material durability and longevity is how long should a building last and it's not that easy of a question to answer there are people that tell you that a building should last about 10 years to keep pace with technology there are other people that tell you a building should last for 500 years so somewhere in between five or excuse me 10 and 500 is is the correct answer my story or the personal story I have for my dis dissertation research, research started in Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area. I was in a green building materials store at the time and the guy who owned the store wanted to talk to me because I was doing a PhD in building construction specifically on green building materials. We had a, a rather long discussion about what the appropriate lifetime for material was. He started talking about ICF, and he said that technology shells, is what he called them, are, are bad. They're lightweight, they're temporary. Um, I said, isn't everything. They have a high level of design and they don't last very long. He used to build wood frame construction. He said it was flimsy and it used unsustainable quantities of forest resources. He said that buildings should be built to endure. So his solution? ICF. Now ICF, if you look at the green attributes of insulated concrete forms, yes, they are a very energy efficient wall, floor, or roof form, but they also use concrete, which from the materials module in this class, you should have understood that concrete is a, a tremendously energy intensive material. Uh, I think it's probably number seven worldwide for global CO2 emissions or CO2 equivalent emissions. So it's not necessarily the greenest material. The other problem with ICF is you can't adapt it. So if I wanted to saw cut an ICF wall, I could do that. There's ways of doing that, but it's just tremendously difficult. It's not as adaptable as other forms of construction. So I began to think. I used to think that permanent construction is inflexible. So maybe ICF is not the solution. Lightweight construction can be good. I mean, there are definitely prefabricated materials. As a matter of fact, in Japan, they make prefabricated standardized wall forms that are interchangeable in a number of different housing options at minimal expense, energy, and material use. I also thought that adaptability is good. So adaptability is one thing that we advertise as an attribute of green building construction is that I can take a structure and turn it into something else later on. As a matter of fact, building 70 on the UWF campus used to be uh, a shop space, which actually we'd kind of like that to be that way again, but now has been adapted for classroom use. So any and all buildings really can be adapted over time, just some are more easily adapted than others. So that, you know, is durability a characteristic of green buildings? Just because something's long lived doesn't make it necessarily more green than something else. If you're talking about the example of ICF, for example, the environmental impact of just the manufacture of ICF is a lot worse than it is for timber frame construction. So durability may not be everything. is the advancement of technology green. So if you look at solar panels, for example, the efficiency of solar panels since the 1980s has uh, gone up some 400%. It seems to be plateauing uh, more recently, but just because you can use a technology doesn't mean you have to be in that state of arrested technology for 40, 50 years, which is a common lifespan for a lot of buildings. So keeping pace with technology or building more adaptable structures, structures that don't last as long, does allow you to keep pace with technology. After a while, you, you think too much, and I think I might have got hungry for lunch. So I know that's a bad joke, but um, that's the way the PowerPoint presentation is thus far. So a lot of thinking makes you get hungry. 
Lead Canada does have or has addressed this historically, I believe. Um, even now, Lead version 4 addresses the concept of durability. Um, the Canadian st uh, standard uh, addresses a, a government report, a guideline on durability in buildings. Um, and what they're really addressing is appropriate durability. So they've actually acknowledged that, you know, some building materials are temporary. Um, others are a little bit more um, permanent. And what they're really looking at, in fact, the first clause right here talks about the premature failure of buildings and its constituent components and assemblies. So what they're really looking at is environmental impact relative to the lifespan of the material. And that's actually the focus of, of what I did my dissertation on. It's a good question, right? How long should a building last? It's kind of a big unknown. I'm not sure we'll get any closer to answering it by the end of the presentation, but uh, this is something you should think about as builders is how long is something going to last? You should definitely, from a facility's maintenance standpoint, be thinking about how much maintenance something requires. So how long should a building last? There's a lot of questions tied into that, and some of those revolve around maintenance. It also depends on what we mean by the word building. So um, in the United States, in Florida, I think we have a specific sense of what the word building means. As a matter of fact, those of you in building codes know that it can mean any number of different things. Uh, in the rest of the world, in a global context, the word building means a lot of different things. If I'm in Mongolia, for example, building could mean something like a yurt. Now, you look at this like that's not really a structure, but to a lot of the world's population, that's a great structure. Um, it's also a pretty green structure. Minimal material input. Um, it's thermally efficient, so it can resist extremes of high, uh, uh, a lot of cold and a lot of heat. Um, the animal fur that it's built out of will swell when it rains so that it becomes weather tight and when it dries off it becomes uh, highly breathable. So this structure right here, we might look at that like, no, that's not a building. Um, and for all intents and purposes for the Florida Building Code, it's not. But we might want to think about things in a larger global con uh, perspective, not necessarily, not necessarily what we can relate to in Florida. In other parts of the world, for example, um, the slums of Mumbai, you have a lot of the world's population that live in conditions like that. And you might look at that tarp like that's not a house, but to somebody that's their roof, that's their home. Um, if we think about that from an environmental perspective, you know, I don't know if that's the right way to, to do things. To, if, if you look at the tarp, for example, from the standpoint of durability, it's not gonna last all that long. Uh, it is sort of a minimal impact, but it effectively does the job of keeping a roof over somebody's head. And then you have other buildings that are 500 years old. This is, uh, I believe, a palace in Tibet. I don't recall the specific name offhand, but either way, that building right there is 500 years old. Um, there haven't been much in the way of material inputs to that structure over time, given the uh, the larger picture right there. Certainly there was maintenance required, cleaning, other impacts, uh, environmental impact. But that building really has stood the test of time. It's a very old structure. This is what maybe some people envision with the term technology shell. So these are brand new materials seems to be a, a very lightweight structure. So we talk about these prefabricated pieces nowadays, um, very efficient structure. So maybe just a minimal impact. It's not quite as low of an impact as a tarp over your head. But really, if we're to envision minimizing impact in, in buildings, we need to one, look at how few materials comprise the structure and also are they efficient? So this building right here, I think you could probably run that off of a couple solar panels and provide power for the entire building. Another contrast here, this is the Pantheon in Rome. This structure right here, I believe is about 1500 years old. Um, probably the largest unreinforced uh, concrete dome, maybe still in the world, as a matter of fact, we reinforce all our concrete now. So the Roman technique was a little bit uh, less advanced perhaps. It was incredibly advanced for the time. Um, but for all intents and purposes, this structure has stood the test of time. It's a very old building, and there hasn't been much in the way of material input necessary other than, than maintenance activities. 
is it an efficient building? I would say probably not. I don't know if they, I doubt that they air condition the building. It's probably naturally ventilated, but uh, either way, it's not necessarily what we consider an efficient or maybe even a livable structure right now. This is just another shot of the, the concrete dome. It's actually a pretty spectacular piece of work. I'm sure that's required maintenance over the years in that it is 1500 years old, but uh, either way, it's definitely a, an old building. Perhaps instead of looking at buildings as having a definite or determinate lifespan, what we ought to think about is what a gentleman named Stuart Brand came up with, and I think it's probably my favorite book in the universe, How Do Buildings Learn? And what he looks at in that book is more like adaptability of structures. Stuart Brand has proposed that they're the material of buildings depends on what type of material, uh, you know, how long the lifespan is. So, for example, materials pertaining to the site, the site is relatively permanent. You're not really going to change that. Um, and as indicated by the thickness of the line, um, the thickness of the line indicates a longer lifespan. So site would be the longest lifespan. Next would come structure. So if you start thinking about concrete and steel, those are all pretty long lived materials. The next in that hierarchy would be the skin or the building envelope, so that could be stuff like aluminum siding, brick siding, even the windows and doors to a certain extent. The next thickest line would be the services. Um, that can be stuff like lighting, uh, mechanical equipment, plumbing, things of that nature. The space plan would be the configuration or the of the interior spaces. So. If you think about interior non-load bearing walls, for example, that would be a good example of that. And then the stuff, that's like Ikea, that's furniture, that's carpet, uh, things that have a much shorter life cycle. So the thinner the line in this diagram, basically that means that you, you're going to uh, change those out much more frequently than the things with the thicker lines. So if I'm looking at carpet, I might even be changing those out every five to eight years. Uh, stru uh, structural steel, I'll probably be changing those out potentially. I mean, those can last up to 100, 150 years, even longer. Say, for example, some of the buildings we looked at have a much longer lifespan than that. The stuff, the services, um, those last, generally speaking, less time than the skin and the structure. So site, I think we all kind of appreciate you know what a site is there's not really anything that I can change about it. it's relatively permanent with respect to the soil conditions uh, water table things of that nature structure I think we all understand what structure is so you know it's not necessarily something that's easily modified you might ask Josh Huber about that but um, the structure is relatively permanent relative to the other things for example the carpet in the building the skin, again, building facade, siding materials, windows at times. This is the swimming complex in Beijing, China. It was built for the Olympics. What you're looking at there in the way of siding is actually a bunch of air bubbles. So it's basically like a composite or polymer skin, and those are air filled. And that's actually a pretty uh, contemporary type of siding. Obviously, I don't think we make buildings out of that in general. It's actually highly efficient because the air is a really good insulator. I have no idea about the longevity of the material. Services, building services, so pumps, motors, things like that. Oftentimes we talk about a 25 to 30 year life cycle on mechanical equipment and that's not uncommon. Um, so for things of that nature, it may be not as long as uh, building structure or site, but they do last uh, quite a long time. The space plan, again, I was talking about interior walls. As long as the walls aren't interior, those things, uh, you only have to watch HGTV to find out that, you know, uh, some amateurs can basically take a sledgehammer and modify those walls. So they're not altogether permanent. They do change from time to time. The stuff, the furniture, um, you know, a lot of people think that furniture looks dated after five to 10 years, maybe 15 years, uh, especially in building 70 and the building construction program where we take saws to tables and things of that nature. Uh, furniture will wear out maybe a little bit more readily than it does uh, in other places. But after a while, furniture does begin to look dated. Uh, so it's stuff that gets uh, swapped out pretty frequently relative to the rest of the life cycle of the building and materials. 
like I said, I have done some work on this before um, relative to actually only six different types of materials. So I did look at three types of siding, brick, aluminum, and wood, and three types of roof, a vegetated roof, a thermoplastic membrane, and a built-up roof. I took different life cycles for each of these materials. I also took it, looked at different maintenance regimes uh, for these materials, and I performed a life cycle assessment on them. So I was trying to figure out what the environmental impact of these would uh, be if their life cycles varied or if their maintenance regimens varied. And what I found was it depended very much on what is prescribed in the way of maintenance, uh, how long the material is expected to, to, to last. So what you're really looking at is environmental impact over time. And depending on what model I used, um, I got a very different impact for, for each of the materials. So if you look at just the aluminum in this graph, all the materials were, were different, but if you swap them out at different intervals, if you maintain them a little differently, the impact went up or down, very depending on the model. Same for the other materials. Same thing for the roofing materials. These are a little bit different. The scale of the graph is the same. So these are kilograms of CO2 equivalent. This is known as global warming potential. And depending on what model you use, for example, if you look at the built up roof, uh, the 50 year uh, life cycle model was actually the least impactful of all the other models, meaning that the other models prescribed a lower uh, or a shorter lifetime for the material and a more intense maintenance regime. Same thing if you look at atmospheric e ecotoxicity, uh, the aluminum, for example, that's more attributable to the material than it is to the model. But again, your answer varies depending on the life cycle model the frequency of replacement and the maintenance. Same thing for the roofing. Again, we're looking at atmospheric ecotoxicity here, another indicator, another environmental indicator. It depends very much on the life cycle and maintenance regime of the materials. Last one, uh, atmospheric acidification. And again, wood had a lot of acidification, I think due to some freight or some transport by train that was unique to the wood material here. So. If you're wondering why the wood material has a higher impact for acidification, it's mostly due to transportation. Either way, uh, you're looking at the differences in impact for each of the, of the, the models, and it's attributable to differences in life cycle frequency replacement and maintenance. And the same thing is true for, for the roofs. So what we concluded out of that study was that the environmental impacts from maintenance activities comprise as little as 2% and as much as 55% of the life cycle impacts of a building material impact. Now that's different than what you'll hear in a lot of other uh, places. A lot of people will advertise uh, the second bullet point here, which are that building operations are the most influential factor in the life cycle impact uh, of a building, sometimes as much as 90%. The difference is, is that if you design a super efficient building like we've talked about with net zero buildings, then the material impact becomes all the more important. So that range of 2 to 55 percent is actually a big difference in the environmental impact of, of a building or can be. So that's really what the third uh, bullet point talks about. As buildings become more efficient, the operating energy becomes less significant and uh, the materials become more influential. You might also want to think about the passive house in that regard. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, I think it's relevant to both the topic of durability and also um, things in life. You might want to consider, um, especially when you, when you design or build buildings in uh, the state of Florida in particular, it does matter very much what materials you use. For example, uh, I'll talk about wood siding uh, shortly. Wood, you live in the wood rot capital of the world. So using wood as a building material in Florida, if for structure it's okay, but for siding materials and other materials like that, the, where there's uh, the, the material is subject to the elements might not be the best idea. So the quote goes like this, to keep a far from equilibrium system going, there must be a constant input of energy or matter as when an animal must eat to stay alive. So the more extreme the conditions relative to the material, the more environmental impact or the more resources it requires to maintain it. So you should take that as a low maintenance building is a, a building that requires very little input with respect to energy resources, material resources over time. 
again, wood siding, we used to use uh, cypress uh, a fair amount more than we do now. Um, I don't know what the life cycle is relative to the life cycle impact or the service life of the material. Generally speaking, wood as a siding material is probably not the best idea in Florida. Which building materials require the most maintenance? So this is something that also you should think about when an architect specifies a certain type of material. So anything with a moving component, if it has a moving component, that moving component is going to wear down over time. Um, and it's, again, subject to failure. Mechanical equipment would be in that same category because there's a lot of moving parts or components in mechanical equipment. Over time, they wear down, they break, things fail. Flooring materials, oddly enough, and I think uh, you can kind of get the sense right away when we start talking about it. You get all the foot traffic. If you've got dogs, for example, you'll know uh, that the materials can get scratched up over time. So flooring materials take a fair amount of abuse. They're subject to a fair amount of abuse and therefore their life cycle is shorter. So that fits a broader category. Materials exposed to heavy use, if that can be like doors, for example, uh, carpet fits within that category. Uh, anything that's uh, exposed to heavy amounts of use. Materials exposed to inhospitable conditions. So wood, for example, in Florida. Um, I think I've also got a picture later on in the PowerPoint of a, an extreme desert environment. Anything in that environment subject to the wind, the heat, the UV rays uh, is going to break down a little bit more readily and, and than it might in a more temperate climate. Temperate, excuse me. Finishes, um, I think that goes without saying that fits within the category of stuff according to Stuart Brand. So it's definitely got a, a shorter life cycle. Sealants, um, sealant materials, for example, in around bathtubs, in around plumbing fixtures, in around windows, those all break down over a pretty short period of time regardless of the quality of the sealant or the installation. So components with moving parts, windows, for example, over time, if I you know, operate those windows on a frequent basis, they're probably going to have a shorter life cycle than if they didn't have operable components. Water heaters, mechanical equipment, again, water heater, I think we talked about this in the energy module, uh, standard life cycle for a water heater, or a conventional water heater is about 10 years, uh, during which time the efficiency of that model will decrease significantly after about five years. So, um, Efficiency, mechanical equipment, those both degrade pretty quickly over time. Sealants, again, we talked about those having a pretty short life cycle. Um, the materials do break down from time to time, so sealants do have a pretty short life cycle. And flooring materials, if a subject, I mean, just look at the nails right there. You see uh, Fido running around the house, scratching up the floor, um, even if you've got kids. Uh, dropping their backpacks and so on and so forth. The floors are subject to quite a bit of abuse. What are the factors in determining uh, service life? So the quality of components, it, like for example, if you're talking about flooring, it makes a difference whether you're talking about pergo or hardwood or linoleum or cork or uh, anything else, a tile for that matter. So the quality of components will determine the, uh, the service life to a degree. The design level, and this is going to depend more on the architect than the builder. If the design is good, um, then that does have a way of determining the service life. Work execution level, this is the builder's responsibility. We do talk about uh, the quality of trade work deteriorating over time for the last 50 years or so. There is a good difference. There's a difference between a good tile job and a bad tile job, a good roofing job, a bad roofing job. So, depending on how well the work is executed. Um, the, the material will either last longer or not as long. The indoor environment matters, meaning, you know, air conditioning, the, the climatic factors inside the building, as do the outdoor conditions. Again, harsh environments, you know, the materials are not going to last as long as they do in, say, a more mild conditions. In-use conditions, meaning dependent on how heavily the materials are used, and all, also the maintenance level. So how well do I maintain something? How frequently do I maintain something? I have been looking at the deck uh, on the back side of my house. It is in need of some maintenance right now. It basically needs to be restained. And I am probably going to compromise the ultimate lifespan of that material if I do not maintain it soon. So maintenance level hugely important in the longevity of materials. 
this would be more of an example of work execution level. I think everybody can kind of see uh, what's wrong with that. I don't know if the thermoplastic is going to be the best water seal in around this chimney area right here is a good chance of that leaking over time, especially with the longevity of sealant materials being what they are. Same thing here, poorly uh, flashed job, a lot of potential for the uh, water to get in and behind that chimney area right there. It does make a difference in the ultimate uh, longevity of the material. I think there's differences in quality installation. Again, you have to keep your eyes peeled on this type of stuff. Ultimately, as a builder, you have to stand behind your work, not for just the first year or the warranty period, but over time, I think, and it does make a difference whether you install things correctly or not. The in-use conditions are hugely important. Again, it's probably a different scenario to, to build something in the Sahara Desert than it is in the Panhandle of Florida as it is in Colorado, or California, or Washington State, or New York, or Ohio. So depending on the in-use conditions, materials may or may not last as long as they do in other lake locations. Maintenance is also hugely important, so uh, keeping care of something. I don't know how this flooring might degrade over time. It looks to be ceramic tile. So um, in that case, you know, the material might be pretty durable to begin with, but it's probably not gonna last as long if I don't maintain it than if I clean it on a regular basis. Keep in mind, however, that the use of cleaning products one from an economic standpoint that costs money so i have to pay that person what twelve dollars an hour to clean that floor on a daily basis i also have to pay for the cleaning products that go into it so when you're looking at maintenance regimens for uh, flooring materials in particular you might want to pay attention to one how the floor is cleaned how regular maintenance it requires and how much does that cost me on a day-to-day -day basis there is some parity between economics uh, impact and environmental impact so whenever I have to use cleaners on that floor I create an environmental impact but I also have to pay for it too. Conclusions. Research on the appropriate time scale of green buildings is inconclusive so my, one of my favorite answers is it depends. Um, I can tell you after five years of researching this I came no closer to answering the question than I w did when I started out so you know I think there's a, a, an argument to be, meet, to be made for temporary lightweight structures. They're unobtrusive. I also think that there's a, an argument to be made for permanent and adaptable. So both approaches uh, can minimize the flow of materials. And really, when you're talking about appropriate durability, um, I'm not sure there's a right answer, but it's definitely something that you have to think about on a material-by-material -material basis.